You good? Yeah, give me a second. All right. <clears throat> Well, good morning and welcome to the Rock United Methodist Church. So glad that you're here today. Oh, wow. Uh, we got a lot of people traveling today. We got folks in Oklahoma and, and in Nevada and just all over the place. So uh, and that's, that's a blessing. Sometimes you need to get away on these, on these holiday weekends. Uh, everybody glad that the election's over? Yeah. Now you can get back to watching your favorite commercials, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> whatever those may be. Uh, yeah, no, no doubt. Well, um, we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later, and, uh, and I'm so glad that you're here. I'd like to welcome those people joining us from uh, www.therockumc.com and also those who will see us on YouTube. God bless each one of you. Would you bow your heads with me? Blessed Heavenly Father, your glory is greater than the vast space of the heavens. Your words reach to the ends of the earth. Nothing that we do, say, or even whisper in our hearts is hidden from you. Lord, help us be saved from the distractions of this world. Let our lives be radiant in your glory. Let us be blessed in your teaching with insight and wisdom to your commandments. Enliven our desire to be found in a right relationship with those around us and, Lord, most, of it, most importantly, with you. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The call to worship today is, is a responsive call to worship. Harry? Okay, everybody, please stand. Happy are those who follow the ways of the Lord. God's ways are and merciful. Those who follow God's ways are nourished in faith. In all that they do, they prosper. Come, let us open our hearts to God's compassionate love. Let us celebrate God's mercy and justice. Open, open our, our lives, O Lord, and prepare us to serve. serve. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. I'd like to share the offertory prayer. Blessed Father, we, we are so grateful for all that, you, all that you give us, the abundant joy and the abundant lives that we have, Lord. We're each one of us prepared in you and with you. Pray, Lord, that you would accept our gifts as, as we share them and, and bless our lives for, for eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Uh, we're going to pass the peace. We are going to pass the peace. And welcome. Who's got men's ministry it's prayer? It's, me, it's, me, it's, me. <laughs> it's you. Okay, so we did finish our month of October collecting for Samaritan's Purse, and I'm very happy to report that The Rock collected $742.52. Way to go, Rock. <laughs> so Lori will be sending a check to Samaritan's Purse for that amount, and we're very grateful for 
everyone that contributed, and I know the people of North Carolina and, and the other places will be too. <clears throat> At this time, we would like all of our veterans to stand. Veterans. Thank you, veterans. As Christians in America, we, but God number one, we, he, he loved the world and he just sent his only son. Christians love America and for our nation, we pray that God will give us mercy. Some pray this every day. Many veterans live among us, part of their lives they gave, serving these United States, freedom they wanted to save. Thank you, honored veterans, fought for our great land. You risked your life to go and for freedom took a stand. We must not ever forget those who gave their lives, fighting for our country, leaving parents, kids, and spouses behind. Thank you, dear veterans. On Veterans Day, we honor you. You serve this nation well. For it, you stood so true. God bless our veterans. Amen. Good morning to all. Uh, it's a great day to be here at church. It's a great day to spend with our church family. The men's ministry prayer is the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and sing, Heaven Came Down. <clears throat> Sure. 
first gospel reading comes from Mark chapter 2, 3 through 12. Who is this Jesus? Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can, give, who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on, e on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the second gospel reading is from Mark 4, 35 through 41. Who can control the wind and waves? That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand and sing praise him. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of 
reading from Matthew chapter 5, 1 through 12, the rules change. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, or they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Stand for the gospel reading, please. Today's fourth gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Directions and rewards. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and the children may join Rose. Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame has done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Well, he makes a way. Good news is I know that he could do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 You can wipe away the tears and let you the past to disappear oh let me tell you about my jesus and all the wrong words that you would go and undo if you could who could work it all for your good and let me tell you about my jesus when he makes a way when there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that 
Thank you, Kel. Thank you very much. I'm not going to focus on this today, but I want, I want you to understand the sacrifice that some of the people have, have put into this country. 1.1 million people have died defending the country. Those are combat wounds. Those are not, those aren't the things that happen in, in training and that. That's just, that's people who've been killed in combat, 1.1 million since the beginning of our, of our time. That's a lot. That is a lot. So this isn't Memorial Day. This isn't the time that we, that we remember them so much. We remember those who put themselves in the breach. And we, we're very blessed to have a very veteran-heavy group here. And, I, and uh, I want you to know I'm very proud of you and, and those of you who are who do all the things that you continue to do. And I see this all the time. My veterans are the first ones to step up. Man, it's wonderful. What a blessing it is. So, on to real stuff. Again, I'm so glad this, this, this election is over. Uh, you know, we were, we were prepared. We, we had to prepare for nearly everything, didn't we? We didn't know what was going to happen. It was, it was close. It was, in, in many ways, it was close. Uh, so this week, your political party either did very well or it didn't. And just like every other time that we have an election, we find ourselves sometimes a little disappointed or, or very, very happy. One, you know, we're on one end of the spectrum or the other. And, uh, but we have to remember that whoever's elected president is, in fact, our president. Um, you might remember some of the things, that, some of the issues that Bill Clinton had. Uh, the only time I ever saw an entire special forces group put in one place was when the commander called us and he said, okay, men, gather around. And here's an entire, entire group gathered around. Hundreds and hundreds of, of Army Green Berets. And the, the commander looked at us and he said, okay, men, that's enough talk about the president. That's what you, you have to now He's your president, you know, you follow him. Well, we were always going to follow him, but he did have some funny things to talk about. So anyway, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, did you know there's only been 60 presidential elections in our, in our entire history? 60. Six zero. I jokingly told Ellen the other day when she was born, there were only 48 states. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty funny to me. Anyway, Alaska and Hawaii were admitted in 1959. And before that, Arizona was admitted in 1912. So there was a big gap where we really didn't think we were going to add all that many more states, but we did. Since, since I've been around, we've had President Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden, and now Trump again. Isn't that amazing? It's, uh, 
you know, and we've always had the, these peaceful transitions, and we need to do that. That's, that's how our world needs to run. Now, some people would have us believe that we are, we are divided without question. If you watch some of the news media, gosh, I just wish some, sometimes these people would just maybe go to church on Sunday. That'd be a great idea. Anyway, they believe that this country is di- divided 51 to 49 percent. I do not believe that. I will not believe that at all. Now, some, there are some things that we're not going to agree on, and that's okay. There's no problem. There's going to be some things we don't agree on. I don't like big government. I believe in civil liberty. I believe that our freedoms should be expressed as, as freedoms are. So again, there's some things that we disagree about. Others have a slightly different perspective, but not generally a wildly different perspective. Although we have people on the extremes on the left and on the right, we are a little bit, actually, we're more homogenized than we than like, think. We, we, we've come together. We always come together. That's what we do here. Because somebody has a different idea, it doesn't make their idea wrong. Sometimes people are just offering alternatives that many people like. So most things that affect a person in Honolulu, Chicago, or, or Philadelphia also affect us, and in the same way. Things that concern a woman in Detroit, New York City, or Atlanta concern us too. You know, we think about the things. We think about our future. We think about, are our children ever going to have to fight a war? Are we going to be able to retire someday successfully? This fentanyl epidemic, is it going to stop? Can we get inflation under control? Can I afford to send my kids to college? Is inflation going to bust my budget? Everybody thinks that. Everybody who, who is working every day wonders about all of those kinds of things. Now, if you're here, your perspective is decidedly Christian. That's why, that's why you're here. Now, we all believe in the sanctity of life. We want everyone to have a blessed life here and in eternity, right? That's what we're here for. Most of us most of us don't want the government to intrude on our freedoms, right? We don't want them saying, you can't do this and you can't do that, especially when it's in the Constitution. We don't want anybody to impose on our religious freedom at all. Every one of us, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, every one of us is allowed to worship the way that we choose. Now, we need to write laws when our people get up there. They need to write laws that make sure no one gets hurt, right? Right? We want, we want security in what we do. We want people to have safety when they write those laws. We, we want people to, that, we want deep thinkers who are caring about others. We don't want uncontrolled freedom because that's called anarchy, and that's a problem. And you might have remember, you might remember several years ago when people were burning down parts of, parts of Washington and, and Oregon up there, and they, were, uh, they actually lit a police station on fire with the police in it. Nah, we can't have that. That's, that's not right. We don't want to hurt people. We want to always avoid hurting others. Now, all of those other things have relevance and reason, and relevance and reason is part of what the Methodist Church is. All of us embrace relevance and, reg- and reason. We want to understand how things are, and we want them to make a difference in our lives. All of us want success, don't we? Most believe that stability safe, and safety and even security all lead to our success. They allow us to be successful if we have those things. We all have some different ideas on what those things mean and how we get there, but we're pretty close. There's, there's not many people who, are, who would cross that line particularly. So having a different perspective is normal. We should show respect for most of the people with different perspectives. We should get along. Here's how I know this. We have four different Gospels, don't we? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four Gospels have completely different perspectives. Mark, Matthew, and Luke are the synoptic Gospels, and they, the word synoptic means a general point of view. There are different points of view in each one of these Gospels, but there are no contradictions. They're all the same. Each Gospel is different, though. The authors share their unique perspective. Now, Mark emphasizes the power of Jesus. He actually 
wants, he's talking to the Romans. That's, the book of Mark is written for the Romans. And he wants us to understand this remarkable power of Jesus, that Jesus is, is God. Matthew includes a lot more detail in his, in his gospel. And he tells us about, he gives us theological explanations. He tells us about what things mean. Now, here's, here's a typical idea. They both, and you'll remember the, st- the story of Peter walking on the wa- water from his boat to Jesus. Jesus walks on water. Peter says he wants to do it too, so he steps out, and he begins to make it, but then his faith fails. So, if you read the book of Mark, he emphasizes that Peter actually tried, but he failed. If you read Matthew, we read more about the fact that that Peter had some doubt in his mind on whether he was going to sink, and therefore his faith was a little bit. So that's a it's a different perspective of the same exact story. They have so much in common. Now, Mark and Matthew are are often identically um, worded. Almost there, there are several dozen times when they use exactly the same words to describe exactly the same thing, the same biblical event. Matthew and Mark both tell the story of Jesus' birth and suffering. Mark was, again, written to, to prove to Roman readers that Jesus was the Son of God. Matthew was written so that the Jews would understand that Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah. They both tell a story, but their perspective of the story and their timing is just a little bit different. Now, Mark, believe it or not, even though it doesn't show up first, was probably the first written it's the shortest of all Gospels. It's only, it's only 16 chapters. Easy to get through in, in about a half an hour. Mark is written again from the perspective of a Jew, but it is for the Romans. It's for the Gentiles. So when you think of Mark, you think of, of, of the Romans. Now, Mark rarely ever quotes the Old Testament. Why? Because Gentiles wouldn't understand it. They'd never read it. The Romans wouldn't have read the Old Testament. They, wouldn't have, they didn't know what the Torah was, the Pentateuch. They don't understand with the Talmud, they don't understand what, what the Jewish writers had, had done. Because those were all laws that they, that they subscribed to. The Romans wouldn't understand that, but they needed to know the strength of Christ. Mark's gospel even explains some Jewish traditions. In the gospel of Mark 7, he explains Jewish traditions on how to wash your hands. Jews carefully washed their hands. Their utensils were washed in a very specific way, and the vessels that they used to serve their food were also unique. And the reason that he's talking about these things and sharing these things is the Pharisees and other Jews were hopelessly concerned about tradition and ceremony. They, they, that's how they lived their lives, and there are 613 commandments. Now, Mark gives an eyewitness perspective to that lifestyle. He also describes his people. He quotes Aramaic and then translates what it means. And this is why we know that it wasn't written for, for Jews. It was written for the Romans because the Jews would already know what it means. In Mark 5.39, there's a story about a little girl who's passed away. And Jesus is going to bring her back. And he says, Talitha kum, which means little girl rise. Every Jew there would have known what that means. It didn't need to go into the book. But because the book wasn't written for Jews, but from a Jewish perspective, he had to explain that. So Mark was, it also tells us Mark was probably there because he shares this vivid memory of this thing occurring, even the words that Jesus spoke exactly. So Mark did, Mark's book is more about what Jesus did than about his teachings. It's a gospel of action. Mark, Roman action. Mark wants his readers to know that Jesus was a strong and dynamic figure. Many times that we, we kind of seem to, uh, to make Jesus a little soft. That Jesus was not that kind of man. He was somebody who could walk through the desert all day long, walk up on a mountain and give a, and give a story. Mark also tells us of Jesus' emotions, which is something that we don't see much in, in other, other gospels. Now, Jesus had an issue with crowds. People would follow him wherever. Some of them were for him and some of them were against him. And we always think of Jesus as being very calm, very serene. 
You know, every, every picture in the Middle Ages was, was Jesus holding a lamb or, or Jesus holding a child or something. You know, one of those things was, made us feel that Jesus was very loving, and he was. But Jesus was also a man with righteous anger. He wasn't always calm and serene. At times, Jesus was frustrated at the disciples. He was upset that they just didn't get what he was trying to tell them. He was often angry at the Pharisees because they refused to understand what he was saying. He was amazed at the people who, who were found to be faithful and sad for the people who were lost. An example is found in Mark 3, 4, 5. Jesus was in a synagogue, and he noticed a man with a withered hand. Jesus saw this man, and, and he, in his compassion, he knew that he had to do something. He wasn't looking for conflict. This is early on in Jesus' ministry. And he saw this man with his withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath. The synagogue was filled with people who considered themselves enemies of Jesus. So on the Sabbath, Jesus asked them, he said, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Well, nobody said anything. They all remained silent. He looked around at them in anger, and he was deeply distressed at them at their, and their, the stubbornness that was in their hearts. And he told the man right in front of them, stretch out your hand. And this man who had this withered hand the whole time, he stretched out his hand, and his hand had returned to normal. One of the first miracles of, of Jesus. Hey, Jesus was not afraid to challenge the Jewish elite. Here's something that, that I, don't, I don't know if I've ever mentioned to you before, but the New, as the New Testament is put together, as it is constructed, we know that Matthew is the first gospel that we, that we read. But Matthew wasn't the first gospel that was written. In fact, it wasn't the first New Testament book that was written. James was. James came out about 10 years after Christ's resurrection. Matthew isn't even close. Matthew came out 80 years after that. The first New Testament book was James. It was written by, James half, by Jesus' half-brother. Scripture is grouped by subject matter and type, not data creation. I know that's a little teachy, but, but that's something that you should know. So, so the subject matter we have, if you think about it, you've got the, the Gospels, and, and then you've got Acts, and then you've got the, the, the uh, Pauline epistles, the stories that, that Paul wrote, the letters that Paul wrote. So those things are all grouped kind of together. So Matthew was probably the second gospel that was written, though, and it appeared about the same time as Mark. And it's full of the teachings of Jesus, and this is important because, again, it's a different perspective. The Sermon on the Mount, which we read today, the Beatitudes, the Blessings, is in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches us about righteousness and prayer and how to get… So Matthew is this really big picture gospel. It's theological, it's philosophical, it's genealogical. It lists what Jesus, where Jesus came from and all that. In Matthew 6, we're taught how to pray the Lord's Prayer, and we prayed that together today. This gospel is kind of looking like, like down from the space station. You can see about, when you look down from the space station, you can see about half of the world. And you can see very interesting things. You can see the continents. You can see the oceans. Night in one direction, day in the other. Dust storms forming in Africa, a hurricane in the Atlantic. You know, there's, it's a big picture thing. But if you zoom in just a little bit more, you can actually find Texas on the map. That's how Texas ought to look, huh? Yeah. If you zoom in a little more, you can see it. And, and then you see the illumination of our, of our great cities. You see Dallas, Fort Worth, and, and then you see Houston to the east. If you go a little bit south and west, you see, you see Austin, and, and then you see San Antonio below that. And if you zoom in just a little bit closer, you can see this long string of lights going down from the border, going all the way north, and that would be I-35. Uh, you get a little closer and eastward, and, and, and in this town, you can actually pick out our church. That's what Jesus does in the book of Matthew. This is how Jesus is portrayed in this gospel. He is a fulfilled prophecy. He's the big picture. He's who Daniel and Isaiah actually prophesied. 
His gospel focuses, Matthew's gospel focuses on Jesus' fulfillment of, of the Old Testament prophecy that tells us Mark doesn't do that. This is a very wide and historical perspective. The Jews needed to hear it then, and we need to hear it now. We need to understand that how, how big this is. As the book goes on, it becomes just a little bit sharper. Matthew begins to elaborate on those things of Jesus' life. He begins to teach the disciples. He performs miracles. He changes people's lives. Praise God that he chose to give us all a chance to learn about our Savior. That's what makes Scripture, I think, so, so absolutely beautiful. If we open our eyes to it, it's amazing. The things that we find out, the things that we learn. Now, you have to remember that before Matthew appears, Matthew's the first book that we read in the New Testament. Well, in the Old Testament, it finished with the writings of a guy named Malachi, and then there were 400 years of silence. 400 years of silence. The Lord's voice went quiet. There were no prophets. There were no written prophecies, no writings, no word from the Lord, no great events that needed to be mentioned in Scripture for 400 years. Now, in Jewish texts, there were a lot of things. They had a lot of stuff. They, the rabbis were writing stuff all the time. They were, they were taking apart the, the Torah, and they were, you know, picking out new laws and things that, that they needed to write, and they were commenting on them. There were hundreds of rabbis doing this kind of work. But those things really didn't apply to us as Christians, certainly not as modern Christians. No Christian theologian would argue that they should be included in our Scripture. So for 400 years, nothing. You might remember the first line in the, of the Old Testament is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the end of the Old Testament, though, is a warning. Malachi 4.6 says, He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children, and the hearts of the children to their parents, or I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Well, that's not a happy scripture. It's a big warning to us. Malachi ends with a prophecy of destruction if the people don't accept God's law. 400 years later, we get the gospel. The gospel of Matthew reveals the story of Jesus. Mary, Mary is selected to be the mother of God on earth. An angel appears to Joseph. Joseph and Mary leave for Bethlehem. Jesus is born. Sometime later, wise men visit Herod. Herod decides to, to massacre the children Mary, Joseph, and Jesus escape to Egypt, and they're there for four years. Herod dies. They come back safely. There's a big gap, though, in Jesus' life, isn't there? We only hear about him. We hear the one thing in, in the book of Luke when, uh, when Jesus, when they, when they, how many of us have ever left our kids at the store or at home when we're going to somewhere or anything? No? Just Ellen? Okay, well... <laughs> Anyway, there's a funny story in Ellen's family about that. That's it's really quite cute. But anyway, Jesus is left behind at the temple because they're traveling in a big group from Bethlehem. And uh, when they, they, get, they get most of the way home, they're like, hey, where's Jesus? Well, Luke says when, when they finally got back to him, you can only imagine the panic his mother and father are in. Not only, not only did they lose her son, but they lost God. Uh, so anyway, they, G Jesus, the first thing he says to them is, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? So the story goes on. John the Baptist, this is, now, now Jesus is an adult. John the Baptist becomes a prophet. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, if you didn't know it. He becomes a prophet, and he prepares the way for Jesus' ministry. Jesus travels, he teaches, he preaches, he heals, his ministry grows, many, many people follow him, large crowds are following him, 50,000 people at a time, people join him in great anticipation. If you've ever been to a pro football game or an SEC game or, or a stadium rock concert, you know what we're talking about. It's a bit like that. Tens of thousands of people are following him in adoration. This is the Messiah. People followed him through the desert on foot. This was an ancient spectacle. It was a remarkable thing. It was a climactic event. We have some religious figures today that draw a lot of people. In the last few months, though, it's been kind of political folks that have drawn those kind of people to those things, our secular leaders. 
But the people who've drawn the most are definitively are political leaders. But at Matthew 5, something really big is about to happen, and we read it today. Crowds from Galilee, Jerusalem, Judea, and, and the, the area of the Jordan Valley, they all come together. And Jesus walks up on the, on the mountain. The numbers are remarkable. They were awaiting the Messiah. They wanted to hear what he was going to tell us. Jesus would reveal the first words of God for 400 years. They were waiting to hear what he would say. The Gospel of Matthew says that they had great expectation. It would be a spectacular call to arms. They would form an army like King David did, and they would throw out the Romans. Then Matthew tells us that Jesus spoke from the mountainside to these people who were living in a country oppressed by the Romans, oppressed by their religion, and in constant fear and needing help. Like all of us, in a different way, they wanted relief from the misery that they had prayed God for. So on a clear day from that rugged mountainside, Jesus delivered the message. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, you can only imagine if you're waiting for the Messiah to form an army, that's not what you're listening for. What could he mean by that? Where's the angry rhetoric? Where's the condemnation? What weapons are we going to use? Where are we going to get them? What's the strategy? What's the plan? How are we going to win? How are we going to get these Romans out of here? But hate, jealousy, discrimination, violence had no place in God's plan. Can you imagine the shock and disappointment of all those folks that were listening? They wanted to get even with the Romans. If you think about it, some of our friends have wanted to get even recently. Some even might have thought in this election, good, our new president is going to get even. That's not how Jesus thinks. His battle is fought with compassion and caring. His reward is a mansion in heaven. You can imagine when he said that, they, they went, really? How about right now? What happens now? The one they looked for as Savior was not choosing an army to kill the Romans. He wasn't going to get even. He's going to offer forgiveness and salvation to the Romans. Here's the surprise. You shouldn't be surprised if you know the gospel. We have read about our Savior in Isaiah 53, 5, many times. He said, but he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and it's by his wounds we're healed. God gave us a picture of who he would send and what would happen. If we pull back a little now, we can see the picture. John the Baptist fulfilled part of Isaiah's property. He prepared the way for Jesus. That is baptism by John. We hear that the heavens opened up and, and God actually spoke to the people for the first time in over 400 years. And he said, this is my son, the beloved of whom I'm well pleased. We can understand Matthew's perspective when we remember Isaiah's words also. When he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the ca captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to confront all who mourn. Now it all makes sense. The Old Testament and the New Testament come crashing together when the children of the kingdom accept Jesus as their Savior. I'm not talking about 2,000 years ago. I'm talking about now. All the prophecy, all the gospel writing, all we know about the character of God is absolutely true. We hear it from the prophets with many visions and perspectives. We talked today, Matthew and Mark had two completely different perspectives of who and what they represented. God has heard the cries and prayers of his people, us. Jody brought me an article to read this, this week. It was written by a rabbi. It tells us that God uses our our prayers to change us. God's not a genie. He doesn't give us everything that we pray for, but he will change our hearts. In our prayers, we become aware of the blessings that we have. Mark and Matthew tell us that God is making things right for both Jews and Gentiles, then and now. He's made promises for the present and the future. In Matthew and Mark, we see Jesus got down to that work. He healed the sick he tossed out demons by the hundreds. He commands the winds. He controls 
the waves. He raises the dead. And in their per- different perspectives from the Gospels, we find the stories of Jesus are beautifully combined, just like we are as a country. In this nation and in this church, we're one. We're one people. Do we agree 100% of the time? No, we have different perspectives. The Apostle Paul spoke for the Lord and told us that we're supposed to be of one mind and we're supposed to be united. Let's do that in Jesus' name. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Would you pray with me? Blessed Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to be in your house and to do your work. We praise you, Lord, with all our hearts. Lord, we're grateful for our salvation. We're grateful for the abundance that you give us. We're grateful for the time that we get to spend with one another. We're grateful for the work that is done here, Lord, and we want to continue to be, be your children. We want to be your kids in the kingdom. We want to share the, this everlasting love with everyone whom we come across. Lord, help, help us share our different perspectives in, in joy and in understanding. Give us patience with others and give us wisdom. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for being here today. I hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday. Month of November, we're not slowing down, folks. We've got lots of empty sheets out there that need your names filled in. We have a bead class coming up, a jewelry bead class on the 16th. Same day, we have the big spaghetti dinner. Uh, Harry has tickets. They're $10 each, so let's get those pre-sold and uh, let everyone know. We also have a coat drive going on. If you can bring gently used or new coats, kids or adults, Sylvia is heading that up, Sylvia, and she's collecting a lot of coats. We're going to be doing that through December 22nd. And so I won't even get into December yet, which is also packed full, but let's get November going, and please sign up on those sheets out there. We need your help. We need your participation. Please stand and let's sing. This is Amazing Grace. You can clap your hands if you want. Or just move a little. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth? Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my grace. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your Worthy 
is the Lamb who is slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who is slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. different perspectives. Go out and share your perspective with someone joyously, thoughtfully, and listen to theirs. Maybe they got something to tell us. May God the Father and His power and the love of Jesus Christ and the help of the Holy Spirit be with you until we meet again. Amen. <laughs> That's okay. It's, that was a, that was my. Answer. I like that song. Yeah, if you listen. Let's see. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. 